right, so um, my true story this week is uh, planning for a soccer camp, but being prepared for kids and families. So I got 35 kids there. It's me and 35 kids, ages from 6 to 15. Uh, one little girl, she's 11, has stood up and has become my little assistant with the tiny tots. She's as mature as a high school person. And they play sharks and minnows and go through the little drills. And we have uh, structured modules on the field for standard plays and drills that are about 5, 10 minutes apiece, sometimes 15. And uh, all the kids know what they're supposed to do, and she can guide them through there. And they have a certain gentle structure in between, and I monitor their energy levels to know when it's time to take, uh, take a break and get a drink. Uh, two boys, ages about 13, both probably ADHD, broken homes. I've coached them before. I knew they'd be problematic. They were. Uh, and I love the kids, but I will not accept the behavior. And uh, so part of that is each day giving their parents a little report card on how we did. Uh, Tuesday, their behavior was unacceptable and I uh, sent them over to the shade to wait for their parents to pick up and said, don't come back until you're ready to play. Had long conversations with their parents who were quick to to defend and explain and point out. And, the, and just, uh, I said, I love the kids, and we're going to continue to love them, and they're welcome back when they're ready to play, but I'm not going to accept the unacceptable, period. Not fair. I will not accept disrespect. We start each camp with, uh, what do I want every day? And they say, respect. And I say, how will I know? And they say, because we listen to everything you say. And I say, what do I give you every day? And they say, respect. And I say, how will you know? And they say, because you listen to everything we say. I said, uh Repeat after me, and they do this. Play hard, play hard. Have fun, have fun. Support the team, support the team. Love the game, love the game. Respect the other team and ref. Then they complete the sentences. Be quick, but don't hurry. Slow is steady, smooth is fast. Or slow is steady. Right, slow is smooth, and smooth is fast. Um, all for one and one for all. Don't touch my ladder. And they repeat that so fast, and it's a little game, and they say it as a team unconsciously. Six-year-olds have that mastered. Well, the boys came back on Thursday, and they were perfectly well-behaved. I was able to make them team captains, and I explained to them with their parents that that's what I was looking for. I need you to be that player every day so that I can show other kids how to do it right by showing them you and why that was really important. And so don't get overly agitated in joy or in pain or in suffering. You just I love the kids, but I will not accept the unacceptable. So that's my plan in general. The preparation and the anticipation and the execution are really important, more so than the plan. The plan's easy. The assessment is really important. And the continuity and the reliability, the predictability, but within the framework of some flexibility, like Jack talks about having structure, but then uh, and then intuition and feeling in between. Um, so I, I do the uh, lessons on Saturday night, and then I dream about them. And this morning I was up at about 7, uh, feeling my way through those lessons, and uh, so this this picture is what jumped into my head. Uh, let me share this with you. Where's my share screen? So this is about how sophisticated my plan is. 
Um, I, I got when I wake up this morning. I got, I got all kinds of energy. Oh, it's not drawn for me, you rat. Okay, can fix that. Um, I got all kinds of energy pointing me at this roundabout. And when I'm in this roundabout with us, I, I just stay in there uh, rejoicing, restoring, rejuvenating, resting, relating, reclining. That roundabout, I can stay in there as long as I need. And at times it feels like a prayer wheel. Sometimes it feels like a water cycle of rain, river, evaporation, rain. It feels sometimes like a power generator until it's time to act. And when I act, I just notice that it must be connected to an intention and that that demands my attention. And then who I am and what I've decided on goes out into the world, and then that is an extension of what I'm doing. And so there's a certain amount of tension, and that's how work gets translated from point A to point B, is you got to take the slack out of it in order to work on one end of the tool and have it applied at the other end. And so I just tend to go from roundabout to roundabout and inside those roundabouts, I'm always doing those things. And that when they are aligned with a particular intention, there's a real flywheel effect. That there's all these little piles of kindling, of potential energy, just waiting for a spark from me of intention to come in and turn into action towards something and sometimes I'm surprised and amazed and I wonder so I get this question mark and exclamation point all the time is what comes out of these roundabouts which is this flywheel and sometimes all that little trigger is simply a breath of air starts the breathing cycle in the wind and a little drop of water generates the rain that leads to the river that fills the ocean and sometimes just a little grain of sand fills the beach and covers the world and then a spark of fire puts things into flame and so those are the things that are happening in the roundabout where energy is harmonized and reconciled and so the the energy that I'm bringing to those roundabouts each week Sometimes it's generated by something I read in Fletcher's lesson. Sometimes it's something I read in my own lesson. Sometimes it's a memory of what we said last week. Or it's something that happened to me during the week that is connected to the broad themes. Uh, and everything then gets connected in story form that I want to share with energy. And so it's that reflection and the integration of those things and how the flywheel, like a potter's wheel, is just turning that clay into something, some intention that emerges as it takes shape. The intention begins to shape it, and then the shape begins to affect the intention, and there's a collaboration between that science and art and craftsmanship. And so um, those are the things that are on my mind in the mornings, and I can't wait to get out of bed, but I do until I've felt my way through all the stories and revisited those moments and somehow it kind of gels. Um, I also want to say, um, I wish I could draw this. It's not letting me draw. So I'll save that one for another day. But what I want you to do in your mind's eye is if you'll, if you'll just... Um, uh, visualize this for me uh, with your eyes closed. Let me talk you through this mental imagery and see if you can see in your head what I'm seeing in mine. 
I want you to picture the yin yang symbol, how there's a little white tadpole with a black dot swimming, and then there's a black tadpole with a white dot swimming, and somehow they form together into a circle. And when you look closely, you see that they are actually rotating around. There, there is a dynamic in there at the same time there is a harmony between them. And you realize that it's you looking at that yin-yang symbol from above and looking down upon it. And then if you just adjust your position a little bit and you rotate that circle, you realize that that's just a two-dimensional surface and underneath it is a wooden bowl. And in that wooden bowl there is some kind of deep dark mystery of liquid and fire in motion that's organized with some little engine of change which is being translated up into the motion on the surface that you see but there's deep intentions and deep roots that are connected to other things that are driving this dynamic and so there is a pre yin yang condition in which the mystery and energy of this sacred life is breathing through us and making those things appear as they are on the surface. And if you only look at the surface, you sometimes forget that there's all this deepness and richness and universality about all this dynamic energy and motion that's organized around some kind of flywheel. There's some kind of axle that's turning this, that's making all of this stuff move, which is what you're bringing uniquely to the world to organize it in some way. And that's what the universe needs you to do. And there's never enough time to do all the things you want to do once you figure out what you should be doing. But there's just enough time for you to do the best work you can on the most important thing and sign your name and offer that out to the universe from your workshop and let the universe which is large enough to do the judgment and the placement and know where that is supposed to go let that intention find its place in the world where it belongs and you've emptied your bowl and the universe will give you more energy in response because it can't stand a vacuum so when you give that's how you get that's how you receive and whatever you are offering is somehow going to come back to you so your intention really does matter a lot and uh, and in that spirit that water cycle that roundabout you're bringing the energy every week from all those different sources you're harmonizing and integrating in a beautiful story that you tell and share and because we've emptied our bowl with our story and we can listen deeply your stories are filling our bowl with new insights and reflections it's going to take us all week and the rest of our life to really sort through and that's an important source of raw material and reflection that gets looked at through the lens of whatever Fletcher and I write about for next week uh, which is gonna go a little more deeply into monkey mind and some detailed planning and um, uh, some more examples from Fletcher so that's what I want to say about that uh, I hope